It's summer and vacation season, but how great is it that when I'm away we have Charles Qualls to fill the pulpit. When Eric Nelson's away we have Steve Rotz to lead the choir. It is a wonderful comfort uh, to be able to take a week of vacation and know things are in such good hands. On the last day of May 2007, 1,500 people gathered, including three former U.S. Presidents, in Charlotte, North Carolina, for the dedication of a $27 million library and history complex in the, in the honor of Billy Graham. Former President George H.W. Bush gave an emotional keynote address saying that Billy Graham had been singularly responsible for a moral awakening in this country and the former USSR. Presidents Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter were also in attendance. Such a heartfelt event that Billy Graham said it was like attending his own funeral because of the things he heard. But I can also imagine it would be pretty heady. I mean to think that you we're at the center of all of this. 1,500 people, $27 million building, three U.S. presidents. You'd think that'd be kind of heady stuff. But when Billy Graham took the microphone, this was what he had to say. This building behind me is just a building. It's an instrument, a tool for the gospel. The primary thing is the Gospel of Christ. In our story today King David, the prophet Nathan, and God are having a similar conversation. What does a building mean? And is there something more important than a building? From our sermon two weeks ago, you remember uh, we left off with David coming in with the ark, and then I went to the beach. I digress, but I had a great week. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Cooper at the, oh, it was just terrific. But two weeks ago, David arrives back in Jerusalem, leading the procession. The ark of the covenant is in front. You remember he's dancing wildly, and he has brought the ark back into the sacred life of Israel. And we all remember the central significance of the ark in Israel's history. About a year after the Israelites were in the, in the wilderness wandering through, the ark led the way. It was a simple wooden gold-plated chest made of Arcadia wood. The Levites, that is the priest in the community, would carry it 2,600 feet in front of the Israelite people or in front of the army. It was a symbol of God's provision, protection. It was covered in skins and blue cloth, cloth, kind of hiding respectfully the contents, what they believed to be the presence of God with them. So that even the priest who carried it couldn't see the ark itself because it was covered. It was just such a holy thing in their presence. And now David, having reclaimed the ark, bringing it into the city and dancing, David soon turns to his advisor Nathan and says, it's time for us to build a temple. We need to build a right and fitting house for God. David says to Nathan, I'm living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God is in a tent. That's just not right. Nathan agrees. It's a good idea. We ought to build a temple. Let's go to bed on it. But that night the word of the Lord comes to Nathan and says, Really? David's going to build me a house? I hadn't lived in a house since I brought people out of Egypt. I'm on the move. Tent and tabernacle. I'm a God on the move. Have you ever heard me complain to the tribal leaders of Israel that I should have a house made of cedar? Here's what I want you to tell David. I'm a God on the move. 
I took David from the pasture. I have been with David and the rest of the people wherever you went. I have gone before you. I have defeated your enemies. I am a God on the move. And David wants to build me a house. Well, right here in the story there is a clever word play that the writer doesn't want us to miss. Because then and now in Hebrew and English house means two different things. There are two different ways we use the word house. There is residence house and there is dynasty house. So sometimes we speak of the house of Versace, the house of parliament, the house of representatives, the house of Oleg Cassini, dynasties. It doesn't have anything to do with where they live. On the other hand, the house of Jim Haskell isn't so much a dynasty. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a place over near Atlantic Station, right? It, it's a residence. House and house. So, God continues with Nathan. King David wants to get some cedar and build me a residence. Well, tell the king I'll make him a dynasty. The king wants me to make me a house. You tell the king I'll make him a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So you tell the king not so fast. He may be king, and he may want to build a place to keep me, but you remind David I won't be kept. I'm a God on the move. And remind him he's not the housemaker, I am. Later, of course, God does allow a temple, and Solomon is the one who builds it. But first, but first, God must establish clearly that what God is doing in the world requires movement. God's big redemptive project is not to build big sanctuaries and hope people come and pay their respects. God is going into the world where the rivers need crossing and the battles are fought. God is reclaiming the world. And it's not centered in a passive temple, but it's out there where the people of God scrape and bruise and hurt and heal. That's where the activity of God goes first. So, Billy Graham got it right. He got it right when he said, this building is just a building. It's an instrument. It's a tool for the Gospel. The primary thing is the Gospel of Christ. Well, let's be honest, we might be a little guilty in this one. Well, we have this beautiful sanctuary, this great facility. We're located at the corner of Peachtree and East Wesley. There has been a sense that we might have let the building become our mission. We built a great house for God. Come and experience God in this great house built to God's glory. But in this passage we are reminded that the first mission is for the presence of God to be out on the battlefield, out where the people live and press and struggle. You can build me a house later, but first get me out there where the people live. Next month you know that we are going to launch our new ATL strategy. And it's birthed in this core belief that God's first movement is to be out there. Now, I don't usually do this. I don't usually confuse my Old Testament and New Testament stories. Usually, if I'm preaching from the Old Testament like I am today, I'll just stick with it. We'll tell that story and we'll do another one another day. But I hope you'll allow me a rare trip across the Scriptures into the New Testament. As you know Solomon does eventually build the temple. Outer courts, inner courts, the worship space, in the center of it all the Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant does eventually find rest. 
and perhaps the rest was long enough. Because on the day of crucifixion, when Jesus cried out and surrendered His Spirit, the veil that protects the, Ark, the Holy of Holies is ripped from the top down. Not from the bottom up where it could be explained by human activity, but as a supernatural act, the veil rips from the top to the bottom. It's as though God is saying, I have been trapped in this house long enough. I am a God on the move. Get me back. And now, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God abides with us. We are the new temple. We are the place where the Ark of the Covenant resides. The Spirit of the living God abides within us, which means God is on the move again. Or is that true? If the whole of our Christian life is lived out in this building of study and worship, then the presence of God is still locked away in the holy place and not out there where the rivers need crossing and the battles need winning. But sometimes, Sometimes the miracle happens. People awaken to the reality that the presence of God really is within them, and they feel activated to take that presence into the world. Donald Miller, who wrote the, uh, the book Blue Light Jazz, tells in that book his story of awakening. The time when that shift happened for him, when the encounter of faith moved beyond just the holy building and it started moving out into the world and the people. He had gone to hear Brennan Manning speak. Have anybody else in here heard Brennan Manning? I, I went to hear him uh, in Lawrenceville years ago. Really compelling Catholic priest, great writer who had struggled with alcoholism. He speaks so frankly about matters of the Christian spiritual life. But Donald Miller said that he went to hear Brennan Manning. He and a friend had traveled to Salem. He said he sat as close as he could, so close he could see the blue in Brennan Manning's eyes and the quality of sincerity you find in people who've turned trial into service. And on that day, Brennan Manning started, his, started with the story of Zacchaeus. He talked about how an entire town ridiculed and hated Zacchaeus. But they couldn't stop him from oppressing them. They couldn't stop the tax collector from getting financial gain from the people. And so they ratcheted up their ridicule and their hatred. And then Jesus walked through town. Brennan said he spotted the man. Christ told Zacchaeus that he would, when, when he saw Zacchaeus, he told him he wanted to go to his house and have a meal with him. And Manning said in the single conversation with Zacchaeus, Jesus spoke affirmation and love. The tax collector sold his possessions, made amends to those he had robbed. And out of the affection of Christ, not the brutality of a town, Zacchaeus was healed. There may be something instructive in that part of the story for us too. Nobody is healed by hatred. But while Manning was speaking, Donald Miller said, I was being showed myself. I felt like God was asking me to change. I was being asked to walk away from the lies I believed about the world being about me. I had been communicating unlove to my housemates because I thought they were not cooperating with the meaning of life. And that meaning being my desire and will and comfort. There was nothing fun about going home that night, he said. I went with new eyes, seeing my housemates as people, 
For the first time I saw them as people. I could sense God's love for them. I had been living with God's prized possessions. God's dear children, the dear ones to Him, and I considered them a bother to this earth that was mine, this space and time that was mine. That is the transforming shift of the love of God. When we see other people as God's prized possessions, when we see with new eyes, when we see people as people, God's chosen ones, it's the bridge across which the Holy One walks. That is the place where the God who is on the move can transform and heal. When God's presence is not just in the temple, but on the move again, people get healed and people get made whole. So, God's word to Nathan is a good word for us. The first movement of God is never to be housed, it's to be on the move, out where the living and the hurting takes place. So, what would that look like for you this week? If you are the place where God lives, and you are, if you are God's presence in the world, and you are, what would you need to do this week to show that God is on the move and not just in here? Would you consider that when we stand and sing and make our prayers before God of how we need to change to be better agents of God's love in the world. Let's stand and sing.